that John the Baptist lived on grasshoppers. Now, the Bible refers to them as locusts, but where I'm from, we call cicadas locusts. But why do you reckon that John the Baptist lived on large flying grasshoppers? For the same purposes that uh, anybody in a survival situation would want to live on them, because they're practical. I think of it as like a bank, like a bank where you have a savings account. And every single thing you do out in the backcountry is you taking a withdrawal from that savings account. It spooks me out. The ocean spooks me out. It's a, it's a triangle plate and it's got three holes in it. If they don't fit and they won't, I just build my fire, and I sleep next to my fire. So a lot of people think, well, you need metal to strike a ferrocerium rod. That is not true. That is a myth. Is you want to look up and see if there are any widow makers. Ahead. This, is, this is the actual kit that I carry in my backpack when I go on a backpacking trip. If I'm out in the middle of nowhere, where I have to build myself a fire using a boat room, I was foolish enough to go somewhere completely unprepared in the first place. Welcome back to the Practical Woodsman Podcast. Thank you for joining me. It's good to see you. When it comes to the woods, other channels are busy telling you what to do and how to do it. What to buy, what to carry. And as time goes on, I might be doing a bit of that myself. But... I suspect that what I'll be a lot more busy telling you is what not to buy, what not to carry, what you can stop doing, or how to simplify what you're, you've been doing. Principles. You know, if you understand the principle of a thing, if you understand a thing in principle, then you don't need somebody to demonstrate every variation that the principle can be applied to, do you? For example, starting a fire using a bow drill. I'll tell you right now, I've never done it. That's right, I've never started a fire with a bow drill. Why not? The reason is because I understand the principles involved with the thing. And because of that, I have no doubt in my mind that if the time ever comes, the really, really unlikely time ever comes where I, out of genuine necessity, need to build a fire using a bow drill, that I can and will do it. I don't have to spend hours in the woods doing it and practicing it. Why not? Well, first of all, we're talking about something is reserved for a very tiny, almost microscopically small likelihood in the first place that I'm ever going to find myself in a situation where I have to build a fire out of a using a bow drill. But the the next thing is is that uh, I understand the principle of what makes the whole thing work, right? I've watched other people do it. I've watched very closely. I've seen them do it in person and also on the internet, as I'm sure you have. And I understand the very nature of what's going on there. I understand the nature of the type of wood that I would want to use in order to make my job as easy as possible if I were trying to start a fire with a bow drill. And I understand the principles, principles behind the technique of building the bow and all of those things. 
you know so i don't need somebody to say you know you you have to use this specific type of wood or this specific type of tree no that's not what i want i want to know what is the what is the nature of that wood that they like to use to make bow drill fires and then if i'm ever in the very very unlikely situation where i'm out in the middle of nowhere completely unprepared by the way right I, that would have to be that would have to be in the formula if i if i'm out in the middle of nowhere and i find myself in a situation where i have to build myself a fire using a bow drill the probability is high that I was foolish enough to go somewhere completely unprepared in the first place. But, you know, I'm, I'm getting off the topic here. Topic is the principles involved. It's, impo- it's more important to understand the principle of the thing than to understand in detail exactly what kind of a tree a person is using, what kind of wood, those sorts of things. You want to understand the nature of the wood that, that they are using. You understand the principles, and then in the very unlikely (laughs) chance that you ever find yourself genuinely needing to build a bow drill fire, of all these survival guys, by the way, who demonstrate this, my question for them would be, when, when have you ever had to do that out of necessity? So it's great that you've got that skill, but, um, and how many bow drill fires have you built? Okay, a million. Out of the million, how many times did you have to do it out of necessity? Not necessity because you were just foolishly unprepared. Like, you could have taken a ferrocerium rod into the woods with you. You just chose not to. That's not necessity. I'm talking about real necessity. And, you know, I'd, I'd be flabbergasted if the answer came back more than zero. I think zero times the people demonstrating bow drill fires zero times they have been in any situation where out of true necessity they had to build a bow drill fire i'm the practical woodsman what is more practical in real life me showing you how to start fires by rubbing sticks together or me teaching you to never be caught without something to start a fire with in the first place which one is more practical and based more in reality. Let me show you right now, for those of you who are watching, what I have in my pocket, my right pocket. Now this is not a prop. I didn't do this specifically for this show. This is what I truly carry in my pockets every day. If I can get it out of here. All right. So this is what I carry in my right pocket. Let's see, I'm missing something. Here we go. I have a Swiss Army knife here. Let me tell you about the Swiss Army knife. I've been carrying a Swiss Army knife in my pocket since probably second grade, first or second grade in grade school when I was a little boy. Now times were different back in, in the deep country. And uh, it was not uncommon for the boys to carry pocket knives. But I've been carrying a Swiss Army knife for my entire life. Carried it all through grade school all through high school a pocket knife a swiss army pocket knife is like an extension of my body and by this point that's how much a part of me it has become but this is with me all the time always have a swiss army knife in my pocket now this uh, this is a ferrocerium rod i used to just carry a regular ferrocerium rod in my pocket um, but it, it would rub up against things. So I thought, well, I'm, I need to search for something that has a ferrocerium rod in like in a sheath, in a hard sheath, so it doesn't get all scratched up. And so I found this on uh, Amazon. And uh, it's an emergency, it's both an emergency whistle and a ferro- ferrocerium rod. For those of you who are uh, not very uh, experienced with these sorts of things, a ferrocerium rod is a modern day flint. It's not flint. It's ferrocerium, but it, it's the same principle. You strike it, and it strikes sparks. So I, I carry this ferrocerium rod in my pocket. It sheaths into this emergency whistle, and I've got a twofer, you know, two-for-one emergency thing there. And even if it does scrape up against my keys and that sort of thing, it doesn't harm anything. I carry a flashlight. It's just a little tiny flashlight. It takes one AAA battery. 
carry that in my pocket for any emergencies. Now, <clears throat> you might say, well, don't you carry a, a smartphone? And if you carry a smartphone, isn't that redundant? Here's the thing about that. My smartphone, I do. I carry an iPhone 13 or 4. I don't know what number they're on now. It's a 13 or 14 iPhone Pro Max. The thing is that anytime you're using the flashlight on your phone, you're draining your battery for probably the most important tool you have out there. One of the most important tools, you know, it's your ability to um, keep notes, to use GPS, to call people, to do all these things. So I don't like to use my phone as a flashlight for any length of time. 10, 15 seconds, sure. But if I'm in an emergency situation where I need a, a, a real light to get around, uh, I would prefer having a standalone flashlight. And that's actually, it directs, it's much brighter, much more effective than your phone's uh, light, the light on your phone. And then I have my keys. On my keys, I have a, a striker for my ferrocerium rod. Now, a lot of people think, well, you need metal to strike a ferrocerium rod. That's not true. That is not true. That is a myth. I actually saw a guy break a glass bottle, take a shard of glass from that broken bottle, and strike his ferrocerium rod with the glass. So uh, any sharp-edged uh, object, even a rock, anything like that, will strike a ferrocerium rod. But it sure is convenient, ain't it, to have the Swiss Army knife and to be able to strike it with uh, any blade on my Swiss Army knife uh, and also I carry a striker here and on my keychain so there you go that's what I always carry in my pockets so the, that's the sort of principle that I have adopted why would I need to um, practice starting lots of both drill fires if it is my policy to never be without a ferrocerium rod a ferro rod is what they called it short by the way for those of you, again, of those of you who maybe are just starting to get into these sorts of things. I don't need to be out starting 100 bow drill fires if my policy is to never be unprepared. And that's my policy. My policy is to always be prepared. And that is practical. It's much more practical. I'm telling you right now, I could go out into the woods right now, I have no doubt in my mind, and start a bow drill fire. It's just not very practical. I don't have a need to. I probably will never have the need for it. I mean, to be honest here, the likelihood is that I will never in my life find myself in a situation where I will out of necessity need to build a bow drill fire. What's that mean? It means that if I do it, I'm just doing it just for fun. And uh, that's not enough motivation for me to to put all that work into into the thing. Studying and understanding the principles behind it is much more important to me. So, if I can get you in the habit of never going anywhere without a ferro rod, what practical need would you then have for rubbing two sticks together to get a fire going? Always having a ferro rod on you is the practical solution for emergency situations. Now, what if you're planning specifically to go deep into the backcountry or, you know, true wilderness? Is it practical for anybody to even consider doing such a thing without taking three or four different reliable fire starting tools? So what I just showed you in my pocket, that's what I carry every day. You know, I just went on vacation to the beach, carried it in my pocket every day. But if I'm planning a trip specifically into the deep back country, well, that's, it's an escalation. In that case, I wouldn't just take this emergency ferro rod. I take uh, two other ferro rods in addition to this one. I take a magnifying lens. I keep it in a pouch. I take a, a magnifying lens. Let me see if I can show that to you. All right. So here we, this is, this is the actual kit. I carry my backpack when I go on a backpacking trip. As you can see here, I got a lighter. These are not just your typical lighters for those of you who are uh, just listening rather than watching. I'm showing off a lighter here that has a, a, long, a long stem on it. It's small, 
about the size of a cigarette lighter but a different design it has a large stem and that's nice for getting that into you know a, a stove or under some tinder and stuff like that to get a fire going here's my other ferro rod that i carry and it has a, a striker attached to it um and then there's a an open pouch here in the back i got some water treatment in there iodine tablets got a box of matches and some spare batteries and right here i i carry a magnifying lens specifically for fire starting there you go magnifying lens for fire starting so what have i got there i've got one two three four five different types uh, different ways st to start a fire now i'll tell you how i learned that I learned that because a friend of uh, my family, when I was a boy, took us caving, also known as Spelunkin. These were unexplored caves out in Indiana we were visiting. And so he takes us on this caving trip, and I'll never forget, he said to me, he said, don't ever enter a cave without at least three different and distinct sources of light and he said the reason for that is you get in there and one light source fails like say your headlamp well then you've got backup and if that fails then you got a backup you know it's unlikely that you'll have a failure but it's even more unlikely that you'll have two failures and it's almost unlikely to the point of being impossible that all three of your light sources will fail so it's a security measure to always make sure that you're perfectly prepared you never find yourself in a deadly situation of being without light deep in an unexplored cave system so i apply that same principle to any time when i'm going out into the woods there are just some things you know there's not a whole lot that is as important as fire so if I'm going into the woods and I'm it's planned I'm planning to be in the woods I don't just take one emergency uh, ferrocerium rod with me I take three four five different ways of starting fire I have a huge redundancy system built up that way and uh, do you think I'm ever gonna find myself needing to build a bow drill fire with all of those redundancies built into my system the answer is no ferro rods magnifying lenses uh, matches uh, you know you can get a lifetime supply of matches from one of these dollar stores for about a dollar and you just keep them dry out of the damp air they'll last a long long time they don't have to be specialty matches like you get from REI or Cabela's or anything like that I know those matches are all fancy and everything but regular matches just regular matches you know that box I just showed you that little tiny box of matches I just showed you there's a hundred in there you know how long it'll take me to use a hundred matches and that's not the <laughs> that come in a great big package of like 50 of those little boxes of matches each one containing a hundred matches Are you kidding me I, I'll probably never have to buy matches for the rest of my life so do you really need another person showing you how to tie knots, how to start fires with a bow drill, how to be, build a lean-to. No, what's missing in this whole conversation that's happening on the internet and all this stuff, what's, what I've noticed is missing is somebody telling you why starting fires with a bow drill out of necessity is silly in most cases. Because in all probability, what that would mean is that you're foolishly unprepared. You know, you need somebody telling you why a lean-to is too much work for most situations. Yeah, you know, how many of you have tried sleeping without a shelter? I do it all the time. If I've seen the forecast ahead of time, and I know the probability of rain is next to zero, and I'm looking at the sky, I'm looking at nature, I'm looking at all the signs right out in nature, and they're all indicating that there's no rain whatsoever in the forecast whatsoever or snow or any of those things do you know what i do 
Well, I should ask, do you know what I don't do? I don't pitch my tent. I don't build a shelter. I don't pitch a shelter. If it's a perfectly still night, I just build my fire. And I sleep next to my fire. I do that all the time. I wonder how many of you folks do that. Now, there are occasions where I will pitch my shelter if I'm uncertain about what the weather's going to do during the night. And then I'll sleep outside my shelter next to the fire. But I have the shelter there standing just in case. Now, the, re the only reason for that is not because I necessarily am going to need the shelter, but if I do need it, like let's say in the middle of the night it starts raining or something like that, it'd be a real pain in the, the hoochie-coochie to have to get up and pitch a shelter when you're half asleep rather than just scooping your stuff up and running and jumping into the shelter, you know. So, But that's something to think about. Not to sound like a sexist pig or anything, ladies, but it's often you ladies who are asking me, like, what what in the world? Why, why aren't you pitching a shelter? And I, I look around at the sky. I look around at the conditions, and I say, well, why would I need to pitch the shelter? I think people have some uh, kind of a mystic, uh, unrealistic idea of the purpose and need for a shelter. Uh, you're... Uh, yeah, how many times do, have you heard the argument? I want to, just in case of bears or snakes, stuff like that, I want to have the shelter up. Well, okay, that's fine. If you like being a human burrito for a bear, that's fine. Personally, if a bear comes at me, I would prefer to be able to jump up and be free to move about and get out of there and not get tangled up in an unnecessary tent or shelter. But that's just me. Maybe you think that a tent or a shelter has some sort of force beam around it keeping bears from coming through that little tiny delicate fabric. But no, the bear the bear can get in a lot easier than you can get out. How about knots? You know, a lot of people teaching knots and everything on the internet. I like knots, I like studying knots, but here's the reality about knots. You're only gonna need to know about three or four that that you learn through experience are your preferred ones that get the job done and then that's it you don't have to know a hundred different knots you need to know like three or four um, if I can find it and I'll show you here I'll superimpose a video of me wrapping my wool blanket I have no special knot for that it's something I come up with and it works on friction you know, again, we're talking about the nature of things, the principles behind knots. And I'll tell you this, 99% of the knots that I use is the same knot, and it's a slip knot, and there's nothing complex about it at all. I didn't read about it in the book. I come up with it myself. And it's just based on the principle of friction and that sort of thing. But I use it for everything. When I tie up a line between two trees to dry out, to air out my blanket or whatever in the morning when I'm deep in the woods, I use that knot. I wrap one side around a tree, you know, string it between the other tree, and just friction. It's just friction and a slip knot. That, that's all it is. There's one really slick knot and uh, you know this, this whole system that I've seen many people use when they're hanging something off a tripod like a, let's say they want to hang a kettle over a fire and they got a tripod and it's this nifty thing where you can raise and lower the kettle over the fire using this fancy knot it's a, it looks pretty I mean it's fine do you have to learn that knot? no and I'll tell you why because your line is hanging off the tripod all you got to do is lift the line and noose it over top of the tripod all right and that'll raise it that much uh let's say six inches five inches three inches if that's not enough you just loop it again over the top of your tripod if that's not enough you just loop it again to me that it, it's so much simpler i don't have to fadangle up some kind of highfalutin knot spend my time on something like that which is completely unnecessary when all I have to do is loop the line over top of the tripod and hopefully I, I've found a video where I've shown myself doing this 
that uh, so you can see what I'm talking about. You know, when you build a tripod, even the tripod, they sell on Amazon, I just saw, they suggested to me this item. It's a metal uh, item that is specifically designed for you to easily, quote unquote, build a tripod for your fire out in the woods. Now here's the thing about that. It's a, it's a triangle plate and it's got three holes in it. So those are pre-cut holes. It means that the poles you find out in the woods to build your tripod have to fit into those holes. If they don't, they're worthless. So then what are you gonna to have to do? If they don't fit and they won't, maybe one of the three that you find lying around will fit, but the others are not gonna fit. So what's that mean? It means you gotta whittle the top away so that it will fit into that hole. It seems like a great idea. If a person doesn't know any better, it would probably seem like a great idea. But, so, you know, where is the person telling you that it's completely ridiculous and unnecessary for you to buy that? When you can just pick up three uh, sticks, these are, I'm talking about sticks just lying around. Pick them up, put them together, wrap a cord around it three or four times. You don't even have to tie it. Friction, just three or four time wraps around the top and then you've got a tripod. You don't even have to tie the, the, the cord, I'm telling you. And then you open up those sticks into the three, you know, tripod f uh, format, and it stays like that. It stays like that without you doing anything else to it. And then you hang your pot. If the pot's too close to the fire, you just lift it and hang it, you know, dra drape it over the top of the tripod, and it raises it. If that's not enough, you just drape it again, and you drape it again. You do that as many times as, as necessary. It's so simple. Like I said, I hope I found video to superimpose here and show you that. Um, let's do some announcements, and then we'll get on to the rest of the conversation today. For those of you who are watching on Rumble and YouTube, the show is now available in an audio-only format and syndicated across podcast platforms such as iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, etc. Uh, this is good because it means that you can enjoy the show just by listening to it if you're driving or in uh, any other situation where you can't watch the video. For those of you only listening, the show is available in video format on YouTube and Rumble. Please subscribe. I'm going to be showing off all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, as I mentioned last week, there are three. There are going to be three different distinct types of Practical Woodsman show formats. Adventures, shorts, and episodes. Episodes are the podcast, what you're listening to right now. Adventures will be me actually in the woods, doing things in the woods. And uh, shorts, brief highlights of me in the woods. And uh, there will also be opportunities for me to show off gear and stuff like that. The Practical Woodsman. I've started an online community for us over on the Locals platform. That's spelled L-O-C-A-L-S. The way you can join is by going to thepracticalwoodsman.locals.com. Hope to see you there. Boy, I've been getting a lot of good comments on the podcast so far on YouTube. And if I could get even half of you folks over onto our designated group, that group will just be fantastic. It'll grow fantastically. It'll be an exciting and fun place to be and share different things. All right, let's talk about some survival tips that aren't well known or are overlooked. Last week, I was at the ocean. The ocean scares me. I have a healthy fear and respect for the ocean and that's good if I didn't it would kill me my healthy fear and respect for the ocean keeps me safe of course I grew up in uh, <clears throat> Appalachia as I mentioned last week in the area where West Virginia Kentucky and southeastern Ohio meet and uh, I always think about that song by John Denver Country Roads where he says stranger to blue water well, that was me. I didn't see the ocean for the first time until I was 13 years old, and it took my breath away. It was I have I had never seen such water in my life, and uh, you know I had only daydreamed about it, 
dreamed about maybe one day seeing the ocean. And so when I finally saw it, it took my breath away. It was very impressive. And to this day, it's a mystery to me. And it's funny because, you know, there's a lot of people think about being alone in the woods. That's terrifying for them. For me, there's no place I feel more comfortable than in the woods. Now, I moved off in my late 20s to Philadelphia. Lived in Philadelphia for over a decade. And uh, then I moved from there after a divorce. I moved from there and lived in Boston, the Boston area for a few years. I'm back in Appalachia now. But talking to people out there in the big city in Philadelphia, um, them hearing about me going into the woods by myself and those sorts of things would, would be afraid for me. And um, I'd tell them, you need to be afraid where you're at here in the city. Uh, it's a lot more dangerous here in the city than it is out there, unless you just don't know what you're doing. But as long as you know what you're doing, and you're familiar with the woods, there's nothing to be scared of out there. And I would tell them that it, it's in the city, it's here in Philly, it's here in Boston, where I feel anxious, where there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, it, it feels unnatural to me. But in the woods, I feel very at home, very natural, at peace, calm, all those things. Um, now, I did grow, now, because I was in the city for so long, I grew to love the city too. Uh, but still, never felt as comfortable in the city uh, and to this day I don't feel as comfortable anywhere as I do out in the woods but you know all like I was just talking about the ocean having a healthy fear for it um, that's me because I've never I didn't grow up around the ocean and I think it's so cool people who have who know how to sail and, and stuff like that I just got back from vacation from the ocean and you know it's interesting all of the systems that I have in place for um, staying comfortable and surviving and stuff like that in the woods, in the mountains, half of those things would, would fail me it, on an island environment or near the ocean. That salt water in the air is just so corrosive. For example, um, in the woods I carry a, uh, a high carbon steel knife. It wouldn't last, I don't think it would last the year if I were trying to use a high carbon steel knife around the ocean. So in that environment, I reckon a stainless steel would be better. You know, so then what? what is familiar to me is not scary to me. And what's familiar to other people are not scary to them. So if you grow up around the ocean, of course the ocean probably doesn't scare you at all. I remember I had a a Puerto Rican friend talking about ocean life, growing up around the ocean, going out in the middle of the night out into the ocean and fishing and goofing off and doing stuff like that. And it's just so foreign to me. Um, scary, it kind of exhilarating and scary. But then I tell him about my life in the woods and that's scary to him. So fear really is the unknown, right? It's, it's what you're unfamiliar with don't understand the true nature of and uh, it's kind of a mystery to you but all aspects of mother nature is is like what I just described a healthy fear and respect of the woods weather and a, you know this is very important a recognition of your real limits compared to mother nature's immeasurable force and power is a safeguard it helps keep you from foolishly exceeding your real limits or from downplaying things and going in completely unprepared. I ran into a feller, a bunch of kids out in the Pennsylvania mountains. He was on a trail. Guess what he was wearing on his feet? And he was from Philadelphia. He was a city boy. Run into the, his, him and his group out in the woods. Guess what he's wearing on his feet? He's not wearing anything on his feet. You know why? Because he was watching, uh, what's his name? The uh, the guy who does that on TV. Uh, Lundeen. Is that the guy's name? Lundeen. Walks around barefoot on TV. Out in the middle of the Swiss Alps and stuff like that. Um, so this kid 
did what kids do. They watch somebody else doing a thing, and they go, oh, that's cool. I'm going to do that too, and there, there he is. Guy who growed up in Philadelphia, lived his whole life in the city, thinks, well, I'll just go out in the woods and do the whole do this whole trail barefoot too because um, this Lundin guy does it and that's cool so I'm going to do that you know you get older you start realizing yeah I did things like that too by the way I'm not saying that the kid is stupid I'm just saying that uh, he probably should have never seen anybody doing that in the first place it's ridiculous in my opinion that should have never been placed in front of him in the first place so that he could go, wow, I want to imitate that. You know, and, and like I said, I did stuff like that too when I was a kid. See other people doing things, and wow, I'll do that. Uh, so cool. Uh, the problem is is that the, the typical person does not factor in context, does not use insight. They see somebody doing a thing. They say, wow, that looks easy. I'm going to do that too. And that's a problem. It does not keep you safe. What keeps you safe is a healthy fear and a recognition of limits, your real limits. So anyway, back to this discussion about overlooked survival tips. I believe that emphasis is often placed on the wrong things when it comes to survival. And I also think that very few people convey the idea the true nature of how one finds himself or herself in life threatening situations to begin with and what that's really like for example I bet a million dollars of somebody else's money that when you're sitting around imagining yourself in a survival situation you see yourself as recognizing from the very beginning the true nature of your circumstances. You picture yourself waking up in the forest after a plane crash and take a note that this is all the beginning of uh, the movie, so to speak, the survival situation that you've now found yourself in. So then in your imagination you say, okay, I've just found myself in this situation, I recognize that the movie or the survival scenario is now beginning, and so I can pull together all my knowledge and all the materials from the the wreckage, and I'll be able to do some really heroic MacGyver-type stuff. Right? No. No. That's not how it's going to happen. When it happens, that's not how it's going to happen. The way it's really going to happen is that you will think everything is fine. You'll have no suspicion whatsoever of any danger at all until suddenly it dawns on you that you've done walked yourself into a real holy mackerel situation, a real holy mackerel scenario that there's no backing out or starting over you're in this thing now you either will make it or you won't make it but there's no starting over there's there's no starting over there's no backing out and beginning again there's no getting out of this thing without the risk of dying that the risk is real so I'd like you to imagine that you're splashing around merrily out in the middle of some lake right about dusk you don't have a care in the world do you see yourself out there splashing around so relaxing isn't it dusk sun's going down sky's orange yellow crickets chirping in the silhouette of the tree line and now I'd like you to imagine the dawning realization that this lake is crocodile infested 
You've been out here for 30 minutes already. And only now do you realize the circumstances that you've literally waded yourself into. Now, the sickening reality of your situation washes over you and there's no choice. You are in this for better or worse. You're already in it. You have to make it over to the far shore, over yonder, with the resources you have now. Whatever you have now is what you've got to work with. There is no starting over. There's, this is not a practice run. You could really die in a terrible, terrible way. There's no starting over. You've got to get this right. That is what a genuine survival situation is like. It's uh, being oblivious to the danger and then the realization of the danger suddenly coming upon you and you, you've walked yourself into it. The danger was there all along, but you were oblivious to it. The realization comes to you and you're already in the situation. There's no backing out or anything like that. It's, uh, it's do or die at that point. That's what a genuine survival situation is like. So think about it. Would, would anybody ever die if the first scenario I described, you know, the, the type we tend to imagine, okay, my plane went down and I wake up and I'm the only one alive and I've got all these resources, all this stuff, and, um, and I'm going to, I'm at the beginning of this quote unquote movie. And I recognize this from the, from the very beginning. I recognize the nature of the thing that I'm in from the very beginning. Uh, <clears throat> if that were how it, it truly is in reality, would anybody ever die? Not very often. Not in the numbers that people die in real life. I was just reading uh, over the holidays, I think New Year's or Christmas or something like that, a dad and a son were skiing out in Colorado, I think. Triggered an avalanche. Uh, two people died in avalanches. But the dad and the son, they triggered an avalanche and the, the father was able to dig himself out. The son died. In the other case, uh, the person was buried, had a backpack with an airbag built into it, but it didn't deploy. And he was not carrying a location beacon. Why do you reckon he wasn't carrying a location beacon? Because in the situation he was in, he felt safe. He, he did not perceive the, the reality of the p possible danger. Right? If he had, he wouldn't have been out there without a locator beacon. So I consider myself very at home in, in the wilderness. I have decades of experience out there in all sorts of conditions. It was my very lifestyle growing up, as I tried to describe in the, the first episode of this podcast. But just a few years ago, oh, by this point, it's probably been five, six years. You know, I lose track of time. I set out alone with my dog on a 40-mile backpacking excursion in January in the mountains in very isolated wilderness deep wilderness we got started late at night I think we didn't even get started until it was almost midnight and I had been driving a long ways to get there got out got set up uh, start hiking in I'd say we got five or six miles in now here's the problem I was already exhausted that was a problem that I was already exhausted I was overconfident in my abilities. I felt no danger. The conditions that night, while my dog and I were backpacking through there, first of all, the conditions were much worse than I had imagined before we got out there. So what I was thinking was waiting for me out there was a lot worse when I actually got there. I went in anyway, 
thinking, c- confident in my abilities to overcome any obstacle. Once I got five or six miles in, conditions completely turned around. Here's something about weather in the mountains. The, the mountains generate their own weather. So even if you're looking at forecasts and stuff like that at nearby towns, that it's, an, it's only an approximation of what will actually happen in the mountains because the mountains generate and affect weather in their own way. And so when you do get out there, the forecasts that you've seen and looked at are at best an approximation. They're a guide, but they're they're not something that you can be absolutely confident in um, for for sure. You you can't be confident in it. So that's kind of what happened. I got out there, and I found myself in precisely the type of situation that I just described. Conditions changed very rapidly, and I was already exhausted. I found myself overwhelmed in suddenly real danger, desperately needing a few extra set of hands just to keep up with what the weather was doing and the circumstances. And what I took away from that was that I felt no danger whatsoever until I was in danger. Danger that I allowed myself to get into, you know. Felt no danger until I was already neck deep in it and things had turned critical. I was too cold and too tired to realistically be able to walk out of there. That would have killed me, I think. I think that if I would have made a poor decision of, well, I'm just going to try hike out of here, I don't think I would have made it. The conditions were overwhelming me physically. I needed sleep and I needed rest. I remember thinking that too. My God, if I could just get an hour of sleep, then I would be able to to handle all this much, much better. But where was I going to sleep? The conditions were so terrible that I would have died. I would have frozen to death. Like I said, this was in January. It was below freezing. Um, the, The conditions out there were, it was old snow. Old snow that had been melting, refreezing, melting, refreezing melting refreezing and then on top of that what i encountered once i got five or six miles back here with was freezing rain for those of you who have never encountered freezing rain it's uh it's really difficult so think about like uh using a tent or a, a tarp you know you think well that works right for anything my tarp can withstand anything i bet it can't withstand freezing rain because what freezing rain does is it hits as water and then instantly freezes. And then you can get an inch thick, solid slat of ice built up on any surface. You're also in the woods and that thick slat of ice is building up on all the trees around you. So you know how usually if you get into the woods, if you're gonna set down a shelter somewhere, you always look up, hopefully. It, it, keep in mind folks that I'm, tr- I'm trying to talk to two different audiences here I'm talking to folks who know these things inside and out and have been doing this stuff and know all the terminology and everything and I'm also trying to talk to people who are complete greenhorns don't know anything about this sort of stuff so I'm trying to, to talk to both audiences and uh, so if I say something it seems so obvious just remember that it's not obvious to everybody there's, there's people who are trying to learn these things fresh and if I say something that's too complex it goes right over your head and you don't know anything about that forgive me it's not my intention to uh, to leave you out of the conversation I am trying to, to talk to both audiences but anyway when you go into the woods before you sleep for the night you should always look up and see if there are any dead branches or anything up ahead of you that could fall on you in the middle of the night. Those are called widow makers for obvious reasons. Uh, People die that way. They really die that way. So now imagine you're in deep, thick forest where because of freezing rain, literally every tree around you could turn into a widow maker. 
and the conditions are just overwhelming you when what you really need is some rest but you can't rest you have to get out of these conditions and that freezing right you know another thing happens in the woods is when <clears throat> when in the mountains the woods has um, had significant snowfall or freezing rain or anything like that it gets on the trees and it gets on everything during the day even if it's below freezing when the sun comes out and the sun strikes those things the the snow that's on the trees and stuff it be, the direct sunlight on the snow begins to melt it and it begins to rain in the forest it's not rain it's just stuff melting off tree branches and stuff like that but it falls everywhere and it gets on everything so even if you get out of it like say you you get a tarp or a, a, a shelter put up next morning the sun comes out you're trying to pack things up there's no way to escape all that wetness it gets on everything again back to the situation freezing rain uh, my shelter which would which dominates in almost every other situation imaginable it's a pyramid type shelter that i had uh, it was the black diamond megalite actually and i'll try to include some pictures or whatever i've got from that trip i, don't, I didn't record a whole lot but uh, just no match for freezing rain uh, very few things are a match for freezing rain so then i was searching around for any type of uh, natural shelter or underneath a rock outcrop or anything like that i could get under because the freezing rain was making things impossible have you ever been in a situation like have you ever looked out uh at conditions in the in the woods and thought well heck i got nothing to worry about because i can get a fire started in any conditions so let's say that's freezing outside the woods are it's deep winter and you look out at those conditions and you go no problem no problem i get a fire started no problem if i get a fire started i'm perfectly okay got nothing to worry about have you ever caught yourself thinking that how about wind how about wind I bet that if you ever tried to get a fire going when it's freezing outside in significant wind you would change your mind because maybe you are fantastic at getting fire started like I am what good is a fire going to do you when the wind is blowing away all of its warmth so that even if you do get it started against incredible odds in the wind even if you do get it started and you get it roaring it's a big beast of a fire the wind is blowing so hard that the you know the the fire actually is like slanted and you can't feel any of the heat off the fire because the wind is blowing all of its heat away you, you don't even ever get to feel the, the heat because the wind is so cold and so stiff that uh, before you can ever get a chance to feel the heat the wind is blowing it all away so that's something to think about talking about limits right talking about not realizing or overestimating yourself or not appreciating the true nature of the situation you're in until it's too late you're already in the situation now now you've got to figure some things out now you've got to resort to some things that you never thought you'd have to resort to before that's that's what a true survival situation is like it's not like the the, the one that movies are made out of where you crash a plane you're the sole survivor you got all these <clears throat> stuff you you know the situation you can with a clear head and under no pressure whatsoever figure out a plan and those sorts of things that's not how true survival situations work true survival situations work out that you yourself walk yourself into the situation stupidly and then you don't realize the danger until the danger is upon you and then there's no starting over you're already in it you've got to figure out how to get out of it you either will or you won't 
when you see people demonstrating survival, you know, this is to illustrate how emphasis seems to often be placed on the wrong things. I would like you to consider this. When you see people demonstrate in survival, what are they mo- almost always doing? They're showing you how to catch and cook wild game, right? Like squirrels and stuff like that. Anybody who believes that, that they're going to survive on uh, by catching wild animals, is out of their mind. We talked a little bit last week about calories. Do you realize how many calories you'd have to spend to catch wild animals? It all comes down to calories versus effort. So every effort that you expend is costing you calories. I think of it as like a bank, like a bank where you have a savings account. And every single thing you do out in the backcountry is you taking a withdrawal from that savings account. Now, why is it important to think of it that way? It's important to think of it that way because a savings account, by its very nature, is finite, right? It has it has a set balance. You can't exceed what's not there. Like, you know, if you have $100 in your savings account, you don't have $105, you have $100. You don't have $300, you have $100. 100 is what you've got. Calories, I like to think of calories in that context out in the woods. When you go out there, you have a finite amount. So you've got the calories within your body and within your pack, right? The food that you have packed. But it's still finite and it's still like a bank. It's still like the savings account in a bank. And everything you do... I'm not saying most things you do. I'm saying everything you do is a withdrawal from that account. So me lying in my shelter, in my sleeping bag, in freezing temperatures, sleeping, is a constant withdrawal from that account. Yeah, why? Because my body is constantly trying to keep me warm. So... There is no such thing as doing nothing in the backcountry. What you, what anybody would say is doing nothing is doing something. Your body is still at work. And it's still withdrawing from that savings account. So there's this constant balance going on. This constant battle between what you are choosing to use your energy on and the calorie withdrawal that that is costing you. So you get up in the middle of the night, take a walk outside your shelter to take a leak, to drain your one-eyed lizard. That is, a, that is a withdrawal from your savings account. So do you realize how many calories you would have to spend to catch wild, enough wild animals to survive on? The reality is that you will spend more calories doing that than the calories you will get back for your effort. Yeah, this is not like I'm going home to a warm house at night and electricity and all these things. Warm shower. You know how much success the best woodsmen have at catching wild animals? Well, relatively, not very much success. So, for example, trappers don't just set a single trap. Not like in the movies. They don't just set a trap, wake up the next morning and have a raccoon waiting there for him for breakfast. What skilled trappers do is they set multiple traps, lots of traps. The more the better. And it's called a trap line. And they let them sit and they come back and check those traps, find them empty many, many times. And then finally, of all the traps they've got set, come back and with all of those traps, maybe find one animal caught in one of those traps. Maybe two. That's the true nature of trapping. So I'd like you to ask yourself, if I'm out in the woods in a survival situation, am I just going to happen to have dozens of effective traps, which are heavy as all get out, by the way? These things are not light. So you're just going to happen to find yourself lost in the wilderness, totally unplanned, and, and just happen to have dozens of effective traps. 
Of course not. So it means that if you're going to be trapping, you have to make them out of scratch. How many calories does it take to make a dozen different traps from nothing? And then how many calories does it cost for you to go out and scout out the perfect locations? And then how many calories does it cost for you to set the traps? And then how many calories does it take for you to go through every day checking your trap line? We're talking about a stinking lot of calories here, folks. And how about the miles of hiking you have to do every day if you ever hope to get back to civilization? You, Nobody is ever going to make it out alive with that game plan, let's say. The one squirrel you're going to catch does not warrant the calories and the effort invested that we're talking about. So what is the proper what should the proper emphasis be placed on then? The proper emphasis should be on getting comfortable with the idea of eating bugs, grubs, worms and things of that nature, not catching wild game. Eating bugs is the one method the one and only method that I can think of. Maybe you folks can think of others. I'd like you to uh contribute in the comments. And I'm talking to you as somebody who was so poor <laughs> when I was going through my divorce in Philadelphia. I did resort to um, going out into the woods and going out in the fields and stuff like that and collecting wild edibles. They helped. They were a great supplement. For example, greens and stuff like that. Dandelion greens, stuff like that. You're, you know, th there's a reason why people who are dieting eat salads because they don't give you very many calories. You can feel full for a bit on a stuffing yourself full of salad, but you're not getting very many calories. That's why they're a diet thing. So if you're thinking about, well, I'm going to survive on wild edibles out in the woods, <clears throat> wrong again, you're not. You're not getting enough calories. Remember, the game is calories versus effort. Well, what you need is to expend very few calories and get more calories back than what you expended to get those calories. So the only thing I can think of that fits that formula is eating bugs. Eating bugs, grubs, and worms. Not catching wild game. Eating bugs is the one method of ensuring that you obtain more calories than the calories spent for your effort. And that is the objective. Now, if you were going to go into the woods right now having never in your life eaten bugs ever you'd have a pretty hard time of it I think so there are a few things that I recommend that you do now and the purpose of these things that I'm suggesting is to normalize in your brain the act of eating bugs you see what I'm saying like if you were just go out in the woods right now and grab a tarantula and start sucking on it like a piece of hard candy I don't think you could do it not unless somebody was going to pay you a million dollars. But you can normalize the act of eating bugs <clears throat> by doing some very simple things that are not terrible. And then when the time comes, if you ever find yourself in a situation, eating a bug, you're not going to have much objection with it. These are just a few very simple things you can do that will get you past the weirdness of bug eating and normalize it for you in your brain so in this way if you ever find yourself in the woods and you find yourself in true need you'll be able to do it easily you might come to like it so much I'm not uh, joking here you might come to find it so normal that it might be something you just do for pleasure when you go out into the woods so number one take advantage of opportunities to try meals that include bugs that are professionally prepared in restaurants and those sorts of things. For example, it's perfectly normal and common to eat prepared crickets in Mexico. And here in the U.S., there's lots of Mexican restaurants. You can find these things right here in the U.S. I don't know about your country, but it's worth trying. It's worth looking for. So, um, prepared crickets. 
They're usually salted. They're usually sprinkled with lime and added to tacos. And they're delicious. I've had them many times. I have them all the time. They're delicious. In fact, you can buy bags of these uh, limed and salted crickets and you can just eat them as a snack. That's a very good way to normalize in your mind the idea of eating bugs. If you're a God-fearing person, think about the fact that John the Baptist lived on grasshoppers. Now, the Bible refers to them as locusts, but where I'm from, we call cicadas locusts. And what the Bible calls locusts, we call flying grasshoppers. And if you think that's weird, what most people call bell peppers, we call mangoes. And what most people would call mangoes, we would call tropical mangoes to distinguish them from normal mangoes, which most people call bell peppers. All right, are you confused yet? Uh, just know that if that, that those who are watching the video version of this show are seeing images of what I'm talking about. Anyway, John the Baptist, which a lot of people know about, even people who don't read the Bible know John the Baptist. He lived on these large flying grasshoppers. Uh, the way he would do it, the way you prepare them, is you, you, uh, you, you rip off the head and you pull out the entrails. I guess they can have some parasites and that sort of thing. So if you're worried about that, rip off the head. When you pull the head off, the entrails should come right off. You can um, pull the wings off. And then you can eat them raw. Or you can skewer them and uh, cook them over a fire or throw them into a fry pan or a skillet and do it that way. But they're very good. The, uh, it's, it's a matter of mind over matter. But why do you reckon that John the Baptist lived on large flying grasshoppers? For the same purposes that uh, anybody in a survival situation would want to live on them. Because they're practical. <laughs> you know, they're simple to catch. They require very little time and effort. So John the Baptist had he had more important work, more important things to be doing than being out there in the wilderness hunting squirrels and uh, wild banshee and Bigfoot and stuff like that. He he wanted what was simple and easy so he could just get nourished and then you know get his work done, do more important things. Isn't doesn't that sound a lot like a survival situation? right you, you want something very that's the simplest the simplest that gets the job done that will nourish you will, that will cost you very few calories so that you can get more important work done incidentally locusts or cicadas <clears throat> we call cicadas lo locusts are also perfectly edible and in fact they're considered a delicious delicacy by many people we just had a swarm right here over the last summer and I had every intention to uh, prepare a big mess of those locusts and uh, never got around to it. I, I even looked up YouTube videos and looked up recipes and all sorts of things. I, I was really looking forward to it. Never got to do it. Do you drink? Do you ever drink mezcal? Mezcal is a type of tequila that often has a worm or a scorpion in the bottle. It's at the bottom of the bottle. Be sure to eat that worm, that worm or that scorpion instead of wimping out and wasting it if you ever drink mezcal. When I do it, I make sure to specifically chew the worm or the scorpion rather than simply swallowing it. The worm is small enough that if uh, I see a lot of people, oh, I'm going to I'm going to do the worm, I'm going to do the worm, and they just swallow it. Why? Because because of an irrational gross factor. But it should not you know of all things that should be one of the easiest things for you to do to chew up that worm or that scorpion. I'll tell you why. It has soaked forever in high proof alcohol, so there's absolutely no reason at all not to eat it. It's, it's been completely sanitized by the alcohol. 
The only reason not to chew the darn thing up and swallow it is weakness of mind. So chewing the worm in your mezcal or the scorpion goes a long way to normalize it and condition my brain for doing things like that. Number four, buy some bugs from Amazon. Yeah, just get on the internet, buy some bugs, edible bugs, that are packaged specifically for human consumption. So, you should be seeing some images here on your screen of several options from Amazon. And this will again condition you for the experience and normalize it in your brain. So anyway, the point of all this is that if you're serious about practical and realistic approaches to survival, the answer is to get comfortable eating bugs, worms, and critters, not squirrels, groundhogs, and raccoons. Even though those things are fine, I have eaten squirrels, groundhogs, raccoons. I love I love eating uh, squirrels and groundhogs, especially in a crock pot with taters and carrots and all that stuff man mm, good eating but squirrels groundhogs raccoons are not very realistic if for what you would be imagining out in a true wilderness situation and trying to survive at any rate the emphasis on food is misplaced to begin with what is more important than food what is a greater consideration than food all the, at all times water water it, it's a thousand times more important for you to be concerned about water and a steady supply of it and, uh, uh, than food any day of the week like, by the way uh, do you, you're going to notice that I never I never carry a filter oh, I shouldn't say I never carry a filter I never depend on a filter why do you reckon that is filters fail I can't tell you how many times I've invested a hundred dollars in a filter get out in the woods it doesn't work when they work they're very effective but they're not dependable for any length of time so the most dependable thing to get into the habit of is learning how to do things out in the woods that do not require a filter for one thing that we'll be talking about is people worry too much about filtering water to begin with. Most water, most running, moving water you come across will be perfectly safe for you to drink if it's clear. So if you know what to look for, you know I don't need to filter this water at all. And that's what I rely on 90% of the time. The other 10% of the time is water that I, I might have to uh, purify. How do I do that? Well, you saw earlier I've got some iodine tablets, but boiling, boiling really is the answer. Anyway, I'm getting off there. We'll be talking about, there's so many things I want to talk to you folks about, and um, of course can't do it in just one show. But anyway, the emphasis on water is, for some reason, it, it don't quite stoke the imagination like cooking a feral pig over a fire does, does it? Have you ever seen anybody on YouTube or television demonstrate how to build a shelter and a fire when the wind is howling, their hands are frozen, their fingers barely work, snow is falling in massive clumps, there's freezing rain, slanted rain, it's in the middle of the night, they haven't slept in 30 hours, they haven't had food in 30 hours or all of these conditions happening at once have you ever seen that on YouTube people are saying Les Stroud Les Stroud survivor man survivor man <clears throat> wrong again wrong again there's a lot of misconception about Les Stroud I like the guy but as the practical woodsman and as the stated goal of this channel, we're going to be talking a lot about Les Stroud and debunking a lot of the worship, the blind worship toward Les Stroud. Les Stroud knows exactly where he's going to be before he's there. How many of you will have that 
advantage. He knows exactly where he's going to be before he's there. He's been there. Do you know when I go on a big backpacking trip, a 50, 30, 40 mile backpacking trip, do you know what I know is waiting for me out there? Nothing. I don't know what's out there except what I've been able to see on Google Earth. And that's quite limited. It gives me an idea of the the terrain and the geography and what's north, what's south, you know, south, what's east and west. But as far as me having been there, do you know that I've walked in, so I've been into places in the woods that I just walked through when I was lost. And I thought, well, I'll never be here again. I don't know where I'm at. Finally get out. And a decade has passed. And I, by some miracle, find myself again in that same place in the woods. And I recognize it immediately. That's true. That's true. Just like being in a mall anywhere in a, in a major city. Walking through a mall. Yeah, I've been to this store before. Easy enough, right? Right. I do that in the woods. I do that. I recognize trees and rocks, and I go, I, I've been here. And my memory recalls that I was lost here 10 years ago in this very spot. It's incredible. So if you think that it does, it does not provide Les Stroud any benefit to go out and stand under a tree that he's later, a week later, knows he's going to be there, when he's filming his show you think that doesn't provide him an advantage of course it does but when you and I are going out into the backcountry into a place we've never been before the best we've got is Google Earth a shot from above that's it we're not there we're not standing there we don't see what what the ground is doing whether it's seeping water whether it's wet and mushy marshy or whether it's dry and compact and hard, what what the surroundings are like on all those things, it is definitely a benefit. It is definitely an advantage. So we will be breaking down some of those myths and not not to criticize him or you know say he's a bad guy or anything like that. I, I like Les Stroud. Never met him, but we'll have more to talk about as far as that goes. Anyway, the the topic is. You don't see people demonstrating these things out in true overwhelming conditions, building forts and shelters and clubhouses and stuff like that, right? You don't see it. The bow drill. How many times have you seen somebody start a bow drill fire when it's the middle of the night? The wind is so intense that the temperature's far, far below freezing. Um, How many times have you seen that? I've never seen it. They're always showing you these things in ideal circumstances. Here's how you do a bow drill fire. Oh, they got all the time in the world, don't they? And then they they try to tell you that you're going to die if you don't learn how to use a bow drill. Okay. You know, I want to see you do it when the wind is blowing. Conditions are always ideal in all these videos. They're, They're never terrible. If you find yourself most desperate for a shelter or a fire what they're presenting is not reflective of the circumstances or the realities that you're going to be dealing with shelters they always look so cool don't they a plow point tarp for example always appears so cozy and ideal pitched out in the middle of the woods with a nice little fire set just beyond the nose of it now ask yourself this What is the purpose of a shelter in the first place? It's to protect you from the elements, to retain heat, or both things. Now ask yourself this. If your shelter is only good enough for keeping you and your gear dry in nothing but the calmest pitter-patter of rain, what good is it? What good is that shelter? If I suspect that there is a probability of rain, I don't know what that rain's going to do, do I, realistically? I don't know if it's going to be coming straight down. There's going to be wind with it, it could be lightning, 
air moving things about. Why would I bother pitching a shelter under those unknowns in those unknown conditions to protect me from rain or to retain heat a plow point tarp by the way does not retain heat so what's the purpose of building a, a pitching a plow point tarp to retain heat remember that's one of the two primary reasons for having a shelter at all nope doesn't retain heat what's the other reason protect you from the elements you don't know what the rain's going to do what what happens if the rain starts blowing in well there goes the whole purpose the only remaining purpose for having a shelter at all to keep your stuff dry to keep you dry and now you got a little tiny little bit of wind and blowing all the rain into the plow point shelter with you getting your sleeping bag wet getting you wet now you're going to die so what is the point of a plow point tarp to begin with in practical terms it is pointless because its only use is relegated to such a narrow circumstance that rarely happens Do you know what that circumstance is very light falling rain with no wind whatsoever does it make sense to you then to pitch a plow point tent uh, tarp and to get all cozy underneath of it when you don't know what the weather is going to do as cozy as any plow point tarp looks as soon as the wind so much as as coughs person underneath that shelter will get soaked you know i have in in the middle of january february uh, put my pad right down on the ground got up underneath my blanket sleeping bag slept right on the ground next to the fire sometimes without a fire I have done it without a fire remember the two purposes of a shelter retain heat protect you from elements if the elements aren't an issue and there's not a lot of wind you don't need to be in a shelter you can sleep on the ground to close here I just like to emphasize calories 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 let's say that you know I, I went off on these elaborate shelters in the last episode I don't want you to think it's going to be something I'm going to keep dogging on every single episode but congratulations if you've just built the sweetest most complex shelter of all time the pictures are going to do great on Instagram and also congratulations you're dead because you spent so much energy building a shelter that can't travel with you and has made you so calorie deficient that you'll never make up for it but hey at least you will die cozy in a really cool looking clubhouse so i hope you see the points i'm making the survival tip that's overlooked is this you have to think beyond the narrative of the survival and bushcraft community I, I have to laugh every time I, I say survival survival um, because it's so uh, misused but you, you have to see the real picture it's a lot of fun learning woodsman skills and practicing them that's why it's been so popular for the past you know decade but it's not enough to learn those things in the absence of accurate context and I reckon that that's really my purpose for creating the practical woodsman I, I want to start offering context to these things because accurate context will change the nature of everything you think you've learned or know ladies and gentlemen I'm going to have a hard time whittling this down to an hour because there's a lot of fun stuff in this but I hope you've enjoyed your time with me I have enjoyed talking about these things thank you for giving me a an outlet to have these sorts of discussions and to oh get lost in these sorts of conversations i enjoy it i hope you enjoy it too please join me uh, next week for the next episode of the practical woodsman until then take care my friends